Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to this webinar under the Distinguished Speaker Series organized by the Hong Kong Academy of Finance. I'm Norman Chan, Senior the Vice of the Academy. I'm your moderator of the webinar today. Before we start, I would like to inform you that this webinar will be broadcast live to registered participants. We have over 900 participants registered today. The webinar today will be recorded. It will be uploaded on the Hong Kong Academies of Finance website and YouTube channel afterwards. We will reserve some time towards the end of this webinar for Q&As. You may submit your questions via the Q&A box on the right-hand side of the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished speaker today is Professor Michael Spence. Professor Spence is an international advisor of the Hong Kong Academy of Finance. His contributions to the analysis of asymmetric information and market signaling won him the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2001. He is a distinguished professor in Boccalini University, Milan, senior fellow at Hoover Institution of the Stanford University, and advisory board co-chair of Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Spence. Good morning, Michael. Thank you morning, for joining Norman. us from Milan. Well, I'm pleased to be with you. I, the only thing that would be better is to be there in person. Right, okay. Uh, let me start with the first question for you. Okay. You have expressed the view that the global economy is experiencing at least four major structural transformations that have very significant impact on the well-being of the world going forward. If I understand you correctly, these structural transformations are, one, the multi-dimensional digital revolution, two, the push for clean energy and environmental sustainability, and three, major breakthroughs in biomedical science and biology, and four, the rise of Asia. You have indicated all these four developments will bring major opportunities for improving global, develop, global welfare, but also will involve disruptive transitions. Could you share with us your insight on these structural developments and how the world is going to be affected by them? Well, thank you, Norman. Um, I'd be delighted to try. Well, you and I talked before, and these subjects are way too large to cover comprehensively. Um, but but I, I, I think the reason for bringing them out is to emphasize one important fact about our world, which is this is a dimension of, these are major, major transitions um, that the global economy and our many you know, national economies are, are going to undergo. And, and, it, and it makes the complexity um, just extraordinary. It's a real challenge to companies uh, navigating this, to policymakers and to people involved in um, structuring sort of international agreements that form the framework within which the global economy uh, functions. So let me focus for a minute on the, on the digital transformations. Um, you know, uh, on the opportunity side, I, I think, you know, the, the emphasis is, or, or, or the understanding is fairly complete. Although the commentary on the digital economy, at least in the West, in the developed countries in the West, has turned somewhat negative. But the opportunities here are, I think, several. One, um, there are enormous opportunities for inclusive growth. Um, one, of the, one of the enablers of this is just the extraordinary expansion of the, um, of the smartphone, the mobile internet. Um, so you now have estimates of running in the order of 6.5 billion people. Um, that have access to the internet via mobile devices. This is something that we just didn't see coming even you know, 10 years ago. And not only do we have people have access, but the, but the, but the, uh, the streaming speeds have come down, have gone up and the data costs have come down so that, so that while well, this process is not complete, um, you know, you know, it's um, somewhat more nuanced than just how many people are connected. They're connected in a way that's highly functional that enables streaming services, you know, e-commerce, fintech, and a lot of different things. And I think based on that, you know, there's a reasonable amount of evidence um, that we we have opportunities for m massive improvements in inclusive growth patterns. Um, we can see this in, in studies based on China, in the e-commerce and fintech areas, 
Um, but you also see it in health and education. You know, there are just a very large number of people in the world who are, you know, who are relatively remote from high density service environments that uh, where this will make a major, major difference in, the, in their lives. And I think we're in the early stages of this. Another dimension of it, which is, um, was very striking, um, is the global explosion of entrepreneurial activity, especially, you know, very substantially um, around the digital area. So it wasn't many years ago um, that when we looked at, uh, you know, the hot spots for sort of, you know, innovation in technology, um, you didn't have to count on many fingers of your hands to, to kind of cover the territory. That just isn't true anymore. Um, so, the, you know, if you take unicorns, which are private companies that achieve a value of a billion dollars or more um, while they're still private, um, you have a very large number in the United States. You have a very large number and growing number in China. Um, those are the, by the two giants at this point. But you have India, um, you know, in the last five years with just an explosion of entrepreneurial activity and, and, and the appearance of unicorns. But it's, but it's now everywhere. You know, you see them in other parts of Asia. There's a couple in, in Vietnam. Uh, Latin America has, you know, several. Um, and even in Europe, which is viewed as somewhat behind in sort of relative to, say, the United States and digital, um, you know, you have uh, an extraordinary uh, mini explosion as well. And the thing that interests me about this is while it's global, um, it's also still a local activity. So, for example, if you look at France, France has 25 unicorns, roughly, at the present time. 20 of them are in Paris. Germany has a similar number, and most of them are in Berlin with a few in Munich. It is not spread around. It's sort of just like what we learned when we you know, lived and worked in Silicon Valley. Um, there's something about this that, uh, that involves interaction and universities and, and local activity. So anyway, I think the opportunity set is enormous. So there's one other dimension of the opportunity set I've mentioned, and that is, I think there is the potential for a, a really large surge in productivity. Um, and in a world in which a significant number of countries accounting for 75% of global GDP are aging and facing rising dependency ratios and, when, and, and where there's a ton of other headwinds to growth that we're gonna talk about a little later, um, a productivity surge would be, um, would be enormously helpful. Uh, on the difficult side, um, you know, work is going to change. Uh, skill requirements are going to change. Um, I, th I think we're somewhere between 10 and 15 years of having most manufacturing and much of logistics simply not be labor intensive. I don't mean there won't be any people there, but they won't be labor intensive in the way that we have come to think about it um, in the past. Um, this has massive implications for you know, the, the, the architecture of global supply chains and so on um, because they were organized for a long period of time. On, uh, on accessing relatively immobile pools of very, very valuable uh, labor. So, um, so you've got skills transitions, you've got uh, uh, re-architecting global supply chains and, and companies and countries have to adapt to that. Uh, for low-income countries, there's a huge challenge, um, which is that the labor-intensive, you know, process-oriented manufacturing and assembly source of comparative advantage in the early stages of growth um, is going to be undercut by this uh, digital revolution, which means there has to be a search for alternative uh, growth engines. And they, and they may come in this sort of, you know, uh, digital ecosystem entrepreneurial space that I, that I just talked about. And then there are other issues. I mean, uh, you know, data security, cybersecurity, uh, restricting the exercise of monopoly power for, for the mega platforms, just lots of you know, privacy principles that govern the responsible management and use of data. These are um, big, big challenges and we don't have complete roadmaps um, for how to deal with them. And we will probably deal with them in different countries in different ways, uh, which means you know, we face the prospect of at least some degree of fragmentation of what we used to be a kind of reasonably, oh, in fact, more than reasonably, very open global internet. So. It's an interesting time. If we, I, I'll make a brief comment on uh, on the energy transition. I think everybody 
knows or suspects by now that if we don't get this job done, we've, our children and grandchildren face a pretty grim future. It's daunting. Um, you know, we're at, you know, something on the order of 40 billion tons of uh, carbon dioxide emissions a year. China will peak probably before 2030, which is a very good thing. India isn't even close, couldn't possibly with the growth in their uh, future peak, unless there was just an astonishing, you know, kind of beyond the realm of possibility reduction in the carbon intensity of every economy in the world. Um, and, you know, it's going to take $3.5 trillion, the experts estimate, uh, incremental investment globally, public and private, uh, to accomplish something like the energy transition that's needed to keep the climate change to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And in a world in which you have sovereign debt overhangs and rising interest rates and inflation um, and, and lots of different constraints, including those that are, are impeding growth, residual effects of the pandemic, um, it's a little hard to see clearly how we're going to generate those incremental investment resources to get that job done. So it's a, it's a very complicated world that we're living in in some ways exciting, in other ways, even frightening. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, you talk about skills transition, uh, shifting skills required uh, that will have a major impact on the future, demand for labor. And talking about labor, can I ask you another question, a related question? Right? You mentioned Absolutely. on several occasions that the world has now reached the lowest turning point in that the supply of cheap labor in the develop developing world, especially that of China, shifting from the primary sector to the much more productive manufacturing sector, which has helped to keep inflation down and suppress wage pressure in the developed world, has come to an end. This would mean that the long period of low inflation environment in the last two to three decades globally would also come to an end. Could you elaborate on your reference to the loose turning point in the global context? And more importantly, whether you see an inevitable structural upward shift in the global inflationary trend? Right. Um, well, I could give it a try. So I don't think I have to explain to a, 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 an audience, some of whom are, you know, Chinese, um, what the Lewis turning point is um, in the context of a developing country. The, the, this is named after Sir W. Arthur Lewis, one of the great students of sort of development growth patterns, um, a Nobel Prize recipient or in the early days of the Nobel Prize for economics. Now, the Lewis turning point basically is a, a period of time in which the um, growth model shifts from bringing un underutilized labor um, and un uh, underutilized productive potential into the modern economy, typically in the manufacturing sector. And that process um, produces extraordinary growth rates. The highest ones that have ever been seen are those that, that we've observed in China over a period of you know three plus decades. Um, but China has hit the lowest turning point, which is there's not you know enough um, underemployed labor um, to continue that process. And so the development model shifts um, essentially to raising uh, productivity in uh, at least the economic side of the development model shifts to raising productivity across the board. But you don't get it from moving people essentially from traditional sectors uh, where labor is underemployed. Um, on the global economy side, you know, that, that, that process in a wide range of countries, with China obviously being the biggest, um, produced a long, long period of deflationary pressure, meaning holding the relative price of manufactured goods down, um, shifting labor into other sectors in the, in the developed uh, economies, which produce further downward pressure on, uh, on uh, labor prices and costs. Um, and so on. So that you know, what I'm saying is that when you look at the global economy, it's very difficult to be precise about this. Um, we know this process can't go on forever. We, we have to exhaust um, the accessible, um, underutilized productive capacity in, in the global economy. And, and my best guess is we're pretty close to that point. And, and my argument, Norman, is twofold. Um, one, 
you know, it is true there's still underemployed labor in the global economy. Uh, there's some of it in India. There's some of it left in parts of Asia, um, you know, east and central. Um, and then there's a lot of it in Africa. But you know, you have to, re you know, you have to make a judgment. So if Africa suddenly sort of started to look like China in the early stages of its huge growth acceleration, then I, I, I would say that would delay the Lewis turning point. But I, you know, I don't think that's a particularly good bet at the moment for a variety of reasons. That you know, the, the lower income countries, many of which are in Africa, are facing just a huge set of challenges. Some of them sort of governance, some of them related to climate change, um, adverse, you know, or very difficult demographics, um, and so on. So I, you know, I, I guess it's a judgment call, but I, I think it's not likely. Um, that, that that that's going to happen. So, so yes, I mean, if if it's true um, that the Lewis turning point is, you know, it's or these deflationary pressures are receding in the global economy, then 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 the macroeconomic dynamics will change. You know, it, it's quite striking. I mean, in the last roughly a year, as we apparently thought we were, you know, ending our experience with the pandemic, we shifted from essentially demand-constrained growth pretty much everywhere globally to supply-constrained growth. Um, and a lot of people thought that was transitory, and most people think it's less transitory than we first thought. Um, the only thing I have to add is, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm right that this Lewis turning point is, is, uh, is you know, somewhere somewhere near where we are now in the global economy, then a major source of deflationary pressure, which is a counterweight to these other sort of pressures that we face, is going to, is going to fade. Michael, let me, let me follow up on this question. You, you, you mentioned the Lewis turning point in the context of China, which many people would agree. Uh, but then you, you talk about surplus cheap labor elsewhere. Then we, you mentioned Africa, but we do have 1.4 billion people in India. You have Pakistan, Bangladesh, Vietnam, 90 million people. And, and, and I mean, it seems there's still an abundant supply of uh, uh, underutilized labor, uh, relatively cheap prices. And uh, what do you see the prospect of this Louis 20 point won't really happen until a decade or two from now? Because it took China uh, a decade or two to be actually make, be making a very major impact on the global uh, uh, supply chain and the uh, global trade network. Right. So it's a very good question. And I don't, I don't think, I mean, certainly not I, we would pretend to be able to sort of, you know, give a precise answer. So it is possible um, that, the, that some version of the Lewis turning point, where, you know, this is an analogy, right, to the global economy. I mean, an analogy vis-a-vis -vis development. Um, you know, dynamics in a specific economy, it's possible it will get delayed. I, you know, I, when I look at it, I mean, I, let's take the, the, the two big potential sources. I mean, if you take Pakistan, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and so on, they're, they're not big enough. You know, they, they, I, I failed to mention one thing. One of the reasons I think the Lewis turning point is, you know, is near is partly that we've exhausted at least a fairly significant fraction of the high potential underutilized productive capacity, again, with China in the, in the thing. But the other side, the demand side of the economy is exploded, of the global economy is exploded. We have tens and tens of billions of middle-class consumers uh, that we didn't have 30 years ago. I mean, 30 years ago, most of the developing world was in the lower, mid lower middle or low income category. And that's just not true anymore. The vast majority are in thoroughly in middle or high middle income countries. So you have a massive increase in the demand side on the one hand, you know, and uh, diminishing supply of, uh, of accessible, um, you know, potential uh, productive capacity on the other side. So what about, say, India looks to me like it's on a different development path. Uh, it is, you know, not built anywhere near like the amount of infrastructure that China built that enabled its extraordinary, you know, impact in this dimension. I would say a similar thing is likely um, in Africa. Um, if, if, I were gonna, um, if I were gonna answer the question, what is it that will delay the um, deflationary fade 
most likely in the global economy, it would be a, a productivity surge um, based on the, on the digital economy penetration, uh, more than a bet um, that in India or a collection of um, African countries will come on stream so fast as to, as to delay it. But again, you know, I, I can easily imagine somebody arguing the opposite case and it would be, it would be very difficult to, to, to reach a definitive conclusion. Well, Michael, I think you mentioned about the uh, likely very sharp productivity gains arising from the digital revolution. I think most people will agree with you and that the question is, this productivity gain, the economic value of this one, would it accrue to a large number of people or a very small handful of people, this wealth gap issue in another one? If we have time towards the end, we will we'll come back to it. Let me ask you another question. The US and China are two biggest economies and markets in the world. The US is now regarding China as the number one strategic competitor. Many people have expressed the fear that competition may escalate to conflict beyond the trade technology and economic fronts. And there are many countries who trade with both China and US would prefer not to have to choose side. But recent right. events did not give them a great deal of grounds for optimism. So right. do you see the US-China tension is inevitable? Or do you see any prospect of strategic competition turning into strategic co cooperation, which to a lot of people, especially those who live in this part of the world, think would be a great outcome that will benefit us and the future generation for many, many years to come. Yeah, so I have a, it may seem like a slightly unconventional view of this, but so let me blurt it out and then in the question period, people can, uh, you know, comment and attack. Um, I, I believe um, that, it, that we are gonna have both strategic cooperation and strategic competition. And there are two questions about that. What's the balance? And what is the nature of the strategic competition? So let me elaborate a little bit on that. And there are areas in which strategic cooperation is absolutely essential. Uh, climate change is, a, is an obvious example of that, and probably the leading example. Um, you, you know, and if we're going to achieve these very difficult targets um, that the climate change uh, people have been talking about now for several years, there's essentially no chance of achieving them unless technology is developed rapidly as part of the solution and, and flows essentially frictionlessly to every corner of the global economy. And it's very difficult to see how that would happen if, um, if these tensions between the United States and China, you know, can't be overridden, at least in important areas like this one. I would say, you know, there are lots of other opportunities for strategic cooperation, like health, uh, like directing the biomedical revolution that we didn't talk about very much, like learning from each other in the regulation of the digital economy so that it's used for, you know, productive and, uh, and you know, social welfare enhancing purposes and not for, uh, you know, destructive uh, purposes. So. So I'm hopeful there'll be a significant element of, of strategic uh, cooperation. But I do think strategic competition is, in, is inevitable. Uh, you know, you have in China a rising power. Um, the level of trust between these countries is not sufficient um, to maintain, uh, you know, the, the former sets of relationships. You don't have a dominant economy anymore. Um, and, and if you focus on technology, uh, you know, both countries are, are, uh, are, you know, focused in a way on making sure that they're not disadvantaged. So I, th I think, you know, for reasons having to do with ultimately with national security, um, you are going to have strategic competition. It's not just national security. It's sort of, you know, the size, scale and, and uh, dynamism of the economy. Um, so then the question is, what form does the strategic competition take? And here's where I think, you know, I, 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 I would like to say a few words. Most people think strategic cooperation is good and strategic competition is bad. And there are certainly bad forms of strategic competition. If either side decides they're going to try to be dominant in key technologies, um, 
I would have two things to say about why that. One, they will likely fail, both, symmetrically. I don't think, you know, given the state of advancement of technology in China, there's any reasonable chance um, that it won't be at the forefront. And I think if the United States invests heavily, the chances that China, you know, will be any time in the, in the medium term future, dominant either, um, isn't very likely. Um, but if you take the dominance approach, then you, then you approach strategic competition by doing two things. One of them is good, that's invest heavily in science and technology and all the things that go along with being technologically advanced. And the other one is you do your best to hold the other player back, right? And it's that second thing that's destructive, right? So if you, if you manage to agree with each other, A, that nobody's going to be dominant, and B, that you're not going to engage in that kind of behavior except in a few areas that are so critically dependent you know, are critical for things like national security and defense and, and ring fence those, cordon them off. Um, then I think, you know, you know, strategic competition between the United States and China may, may actually be better um, than a world in which there was a dominant player in the past, namely the United States. Um, and the, you know, the analogy is Schumpeterian competition. Schumpeterian competition works great, provided there are rules that prevent the incumbents from taking actions that are designed to cripple the potential new competitors. That's what competition policy is about. That's what limiting intellectual property, you know, extensive you know, controls are about. And, and when it's done right, it works pretty well. Uh, so by analogy, again, um, I think that the right kind of strategic competition between the state, the China and the United States, a, a relatively open one, basically, is, 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 is possible? Is it very likely in this environment? I think, uh, you know, I don't know. I think probably not. Uh, uh, the United States seems to be, to have economic policies on the international dimension that are at the moment dominated for the most part um, by national security considerations and national security considerations is more like a zero sum game. Uh, and they're probably not thinking about it this way. But I, but I think there is a version uh, that's beneficial, not only for the two countries, but for everybody else, where it doesn't make them choose and where the technology spills over um, into a wide swath of the global economy. Michael, we talk about um, Sino-US conflict, uh, and then we have this COVID pandemic. We thought it went, we would have gone two years ago, but they hasn't. It's still affecting many parts of the world. And also mm -hmm. we have a war in Ukraine and the fallouts have yet to be fully appreciated and felt. Yeah. Now, global production supply chains and uh, trade have been severely disrupted. Do you envisage right. that this disruption to be transitory or to be much more long lasting in nature? The question, a longer question, is that do you agree with the view that globalization as we used to know it has come to an end? An end. Um, yeah, and that last question, Norman, I, I would say the chances of going back to where we were 10 years ago, I think are very, very small. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's elements of the, of the supply chain congestion and, and whatnot that are transitory. I don't expect the pandemic to last forever. I don't expect lockdowns to be necessary in uh, major Chinese cities forever. Um, and much of the rest of the world is, you know, in one way or another emerging from the pandemic, in part because we just said, you know, declared it's over, even if it isn't, uh, and then decided to go back to, to some version of, of normal. But that's not a complete process, but it's fairly well underway. I mean, if you're in the UK now, you know, basically they've said it's over. You know, that doesn't mean there's no infections. It just means they're conducting themselves you know, by policy and just individual behavior day to day, as if, you know, we've finished with this, and we're, we're moving on. Um, so that part's transitory, uh, and global supply chains will adapt. The, the part that I think is not transitory um, is, is the following. We are going with global supply chains, global supply and demand chains, are facing a whole variety of shocks. Some of them are delivered, have been delivered by the pandemic, and we're not out of the woods on that. 
a lot of them are de being delivered in a way that affects macroeconomic performance by climate change. I mean, it's really very striking. Um, some of them are being delivered by these geopolitical tensions, and you know, and they can go, you know, in a direction that's less, you know, bad, uh, less destructive, or or more destructive. But the you, but the conflict in Ukraine, I think, is going to be the trigger for a major shift um, in both corporate behavior and and in policy in the direction of diversification. Um, and it isn't driven just by the war. It'll it'll be focused initially, for sure, on um, energy diversification in Europe, and it will be a somewhat painful process that will probably cause a recession. Um, but it's but it's underway. But I think there's a growing recognition that the world in, in, that we lived in, you know, before, in the, say, in the past decades, that was not free of shocks, but didn't have so many shocks that you know that you had to pay a huge amount of attention to them. Um, a world in which you know supply chains were driven by efficiency and comparative advantage considerations mainly is is going to get displaced uh, by a world in which by policy and corporate uh, strategy um, exhibits a pattern of diversification, and some of this will be enabled by technology. Some of the digital technologies allow this. So part of this is self-sufficiency. Part of it is just plain diversification of the type that you know you and your colleagues are very familiar with in finance. You know, if you have a significant amount of risks and they're not completely perfectly correlated, you diversify. I mean, it just makes sense. Uh, we all learned that from Markowitz, you know, in our early stages of our our, our education. So, so we're going to see diversification. I'm pretty sure of that. And that, that pattern of diversification, you know, it seems to me will, will be a kind of permanent shift in the way global supply chains are put together. And, and, and to the extent it's driven by geopolitical tensions, and this is the, the worrying part, to the extent it's driven by that, as opposed to shocks that just come out of nowhere from climate and other places, uh, it will be, it will have a bias in the direction of what I call reliable trading partners. You know, this is what Janet Yellen recently called friend shoring, right? And this is a movement in the direction of dividing the global economy up into, into um, spheres, right? With China at the center of one of them, and maybe Europe and the United States at the center of the other, and and that's 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 a prospect that puts a lot of other countries um, in Asia and elsewhere in the difficult position of not wanting to choose, uh, but perhaps being forced to, and the and the very widespread use of sanctions, especially by the United States, which are in some ways weapons of mass mass destruction, of a, a kind of economic kind. You know, there's a very good article by Raghuram Rajan in Project Syndicate on this. Um, you know, at some point we're going to have to decide whether there really ought to be limits on this. But those sanctions and the potential for their future use um, will also put pressure in, you know, on uh, moving people into, you know, separate spheres um, in the future. So that's a, that's a scenario that runs counter to. Uh, you know, a reasonably open, full multilateral system um, that benefits um, uh, that benefits a wide range of countries, especially the early stage developing countries. So that's not that's not an attractive scenario. But the diversification part, if we can keep keep the friend throwing or you know reliable trading partners, you know, uh, a little bit under control, is is I think you know just a response to a more shock prone world. Thank you. Uh, um, it's time to move on to the question and answer sessions. Uh, I would like to remind the audience that you could raise questions by submitting your question via the Q&A box on the right-hand side of the screen. Now, we have the first question from Professor Lawrence Lau of the CUHK, who is also a fellow of the Academy of Finance. Larry, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Norman. Hello, Michael. Hi, Larry. I really enjoyed your talk. Nice to um, see you. Yeah, good to see you. Um, <clears throat> let me first begin by uh, saying that I really agree with you, your point of view, that strategic competition actually may yield some benefits. Okay, because I've always claimed that decoupling 
even though people think all sorts of costs to decoupling. But decoupling is not a bad thing uh, in itself because decoupling basically means that you will have a second source. And having a second source means that you are really protected from disruptions, uh, from natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis, tornadoes, you know, uh, what have you. Uh, not only from natural Absolutely. disasters, but also from wars, revolutions, and many other geopolitical conflicts. So I right. think actually it is a good thing. And, uh, and, and I actually feel that, um, that, you know, it is actually not bad for the world if there's an alternative uh, payment system to SWIFT. Uh, you know, and, and I always claim that having two systems, you know, more than one system, is actually good because not everything will fail all at once. Okay, so if That's we right. have That's right. Parallel, right. if we have parallel internet, uh, it's yep. great, and uh, we don't want things to fail all at once. Okay, so I think one development that I foresee is that eventually we will have second sourcing, third sourcing of almost everything, and that will have the benefit one is making the world safer <laughs> against <laughs> disasters, but it would also make the world more competitive. Okay, because if you have second, right. third source, that there's no monopoly power. You don't have end time saying that, oh, Apple is not allowed to do this, or Facebook or you, is not allowed to do this, right? You know, because if there's competition, it will be okay. It will be relatively okay. Um, so right. I'm reasonably optimistic. But I actually, Michael, I want to ask you is, how likely do you think this more positive scenario will pay out. I actually remember what you said, and that is, we must not have any one country wanting to be dominant. <laughs> that is, as long as we have one or more countries wanting to be dominant, then it's really very hard for this to happen because for the world to split up into two spheres is not good. What you want to do, have a second source, but the world still works as one. Thank you. I completely agree with that, Larry. I mean, I, you know, how likely is it? I, uh, I would say the directionality on the American side is negative with respect to this now. The foreign policy, you know, or national security agenda seems to be, for the most part, in ascendancy. Um, I mean, there are some cracks in that. There's a, a recent, you know, rumor that there's a bit of controversy within the current administration in the United States between the economists and the national security people over precisely the question of whether it makes sense to keep all the tariffs that the Trump administration put in place in China, you know, if we want to sort of find a different balance uh, between strategic competition and strategic operation. But for the most part, um, I don't think, you know, I, I think we're not at, at at heading in the right direction. And if we're not, then I think it's harder um, for the Chinese uh, authorities to, you know, kind of move along with us. So they have, probably have to sort of play the game in a similar fashion, at least for a while. And China has major short run challenges with respect to sort of growth and maybe even stability um, coming out of the pandemic with the property taxes and a continuing challenge of shifting the growth model over to the right mixture of domestic demand, You and things you and I have talked about for, for years. So, um, and, and I mentioned those things not because they're directly relevant, but because, you know, there's a limited ability to deal with everything at the same time, no matter where you are. And if you've got big challenges domestically, uh, you know, in China and or the United States, uh, you know, it's very difficult to, to see, you know, how you're going to focus on this. So by and large, I'm sort of, at least in the short to medium term, a little bit pessimistic on whether we can achieve the kind of vision that you just outlined, which is, a, a, a you know, intense competition, but of a relatively open kind with multiple sources and, and, and so on. I'd like, I, w I wish I could give you a different answer, but I, d I don't think I can. Okay, thank you. Our second question, uh, is from Ms. Wang Tao, Chief Chinese China Economist and Head of Asia Economics at UBS. Tao, please. Oh, yeah. 
Thank you, hello. Norman. Uh, hello. Hi, Professor Spence. Uh, nice to see you again. You have Good come to, to our, uh, our meetings. Um, I yeah. have a question about the current uh, central bank policy uh, in light of the sectoral changes, um, the regime shift you mentioned. Right now in right. the market, people tend to think that the Fed and is you know, behind the curve and there's too much inflation and people expect aggressive tightening ahead. But since some part of the inflation may be transitory and, and other parts may be due to structural changes that you mentioned, um, deglobalization, decarbonization and supply chain shock that affects yep. demand and supply side very differently, different sectors very differently, right? So that, that shifts right. the relative price. Uh, so my question is, in your view, should the central bank really use monetary policy as aggressively as some people think they should to bring down inflation to the normal sort of 2% when maybe we're shifting to a new normal kind of world and allow inflation maybe above uh, the previous trend so that the sectoral adjustment can take place? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, so let, let me start by saying I'm, you know, I'm really glad I'm not a central banker mm -hmm. uh, right now because um, they seem to me to be in a very difficult position. Now, maybe they got themselves into a difficult position. There's some, you know, pretty heavyweight commentators who said they were going to do this um, when they were sticking to the kind of it really is transitory, meaning relic quite short run. Um, but I, if, I, if I understand the directionality of your question, I think the wrong thing to do would be to slam on the brakes um, so quickly that you immediately brought demand and supply into into uh, balance, and you know, and took away the inflationary pressures because I think you know you'd produce a, a, an unnecessary and massive downturn, um, at least in the places where that occurred. And it seems to me, in a world that's you know has these kind of conflicts and multiple multiple challenges. Um, and and some fragility, uh, you know, associated with coming out of the pandemic, with you know the, all these supply chain blockages. Uh, you know, I would try to. I mean, if I were a central banker, and I, I repeat, I'm glad I'm not. I would try to strike a balance and just accept that you know we're going to have a period of higher inflation. Higher inflation is pretty costly politically in many places. It turns out I didn't know this before. Um, but it turns out, you know, people are, you know, voters uh, are very sensitive um, to inflation, especially in the energy area. I guess in America, it's because we all drive our cars all over the place all the time. Uh, but the, but the, but so that may be fairly unpopular um, choice, uh, and it's certainly a difficult choice. But I think, uh, you know, from the point of view of the longer term health of the global economy, and not, you know, it introducing additional barriers and headwinds to um, dealing with really important things like the energy transition, you know, producing a fairly massive um, downturn um, of the type that, you know, we saw in the early 1980s, you know, when, when inflation was out of control and inflationary expectations were embedded. Um, it, you know, I think there's a risk they're going to get embedded right now. Um, and if we kind of adopt the strategy of trying to find a middle ground, uh, raising interest rates but not slamming the brakes on, you know, maybe we'll embed them uh, in a in a more kind of uh, you know permanent way and make it more difficult, require a next Volcker um, to get rid of them. But but I, but I think right now there's enough transitory, even though it's longer duration than we had originally thought. Um, that justifies this kind of middle middle path. So I'm a little worried about the aggressiveness of the the recent statements by especially the Fed. The, the European Central Bank is not quite there, um, although they're 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 also in a pretty tough position as well. Okay. Next we have uh, Mr. Benjamin Hong, Standard Chartered Bank's CEO for Asia. Ben, please. Hi, thank you, Norman, and, and thank you, Professor Spence. I always enjoy listening to you and your insights. 
Um, uh, can I uh, follow, continue the dialogue on this inflation subject, which I think earlier on your conversation with, with Norman, uh, I am like, like Norman, I am wondering whether India and a good part of ASEAN markets can be that next China to squeeze out that, that, that ounce of labor uh, efficiency. But let's park that aside for a minute. What I, what I sense is um, the West, uh, I do think there's an element of inflation hysteria, which drives, well, like Wang Tao said, um, a lot of hawkish stance and, and the worry is you drive down the, the growth curve. Now, contrast that in the East, uh, where inflation is a lot more moderate, whether it's China, right. Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore. Uh, we're still yep. operating at a kind of 20% levels. Can, can you share some thoughts about why this phenomenon uh, and whether this twin speed East versus West inflation can be a sustainable, uh, I would say, picture, because that in turn drives monetary policy also out in the East? It's a good question. I mean, uh, you know, no, I don't think, you know, you'll get a kind of permanent bifurcation. Um, you know, Take energy prices, for example. Uh, they're still set globally. You know, maybe we'll get to a point where they're, they're you know, they're segmented markets, but they're not right now. Um, in spite of all the kind of conflict and you know diversification and chaos that's going on. Um, so I, I mean, I, I think in ultimately, you know, demand and supply pressures. You know, in even in a in a somewhat more fragmented global economy are, are tend to show up kind of globally. And so, so I, you're probably right. I mean, you know, we have transitory kind of effects that are pretty large and, you know, scary numbers, 7.58%, you know, in kind of recent reports. Um, it's probably better to take a deep breath and say, well, you know, that's not happening everywhere in the world, you know, though, Supply chains are still relatively flexible. They'll start moving around. Um, and eventually, uh, these pressures will, will, will recede. Uh, having said that, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, so the tradable part of the global economy is a big part, but, you know, the non-tradable part <laughs> of any particular economy, you know, a high middle income or a high income economy is pretty large. It's like two thirds of the economy. So there's an element, you know, that's kind of local, uh, and and that um, so you can see significant kind of divergences. I mean, in, in in the United States, for example, we're seeing not just these transitory sort of supply chain problems, some of which are self-inflicted wounds. I mean, you know, we don't we don't. I mean, a friend of mine. I mean, let me tell a story. Somebody I met, a friend of mine who used to be in charge of kind of logistics globally um, for Amazon, I decided and has retired and moved on to kind of the investing world, you know, decided to figure out what was happening in Long Beach, which is our major West Coast port um, where the imports come in. So he and a friend went out in a boat and they looked at the port um, and the containers were stacked too high. Uh, and there wasn't enough room for the containers because they weren't being sort of offloaded and cleared through the trucking system. So they phoned the head of the port and said, um, you got to stack the containers higher. And the head of the port said, I can't. There's a local ordinance that says I can't stack containers. So they look like an ordinary you know, port in China or Singapore or so on. Um, and then they called the mayor and said, you got to change the ordinance. I mean, there's all kinds of these stupid little blockages you know, and we don't seem to have a system, you know, maybe maybe in China this is done better, you know, when blockages occur, they're removed faster um, when they can be. Um, but in the United States, you know, we seem to be pretty slow moving on that. So that's the idiosyncratic part. But we're seeing fundamental changes in the labor market behavior um, that, you know, I don't think people completely understand. Under this heading, the great resignation, you know, uh, People quitting at uh, you know at rates we haven't seen for for decades and so on. So I think there's a, there is something that is uh, at least more durable um, in the inflationary pressures than than we ever than anybody, including the central banks, anticipated. Um, so they're navigating you know in a 
fairly for, with a fairly high degree of uncertainty, um, along with everybody else. Yeah. Our next question is from Ms. Nisa Leung, managing partner of Chiming Venture Partners. Nisa, please mm -hmm. go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Norman. Hi, Dean Spence. Good to see you again. Um, Good to since, see you. Yeah, since we're limited to only one question, I actually had a whole bunch of questions. I, um, um, but I did uh, hear that you mentioned that we did not talk about healthcare, which is, uh, you know, um, one of the uh, factors of major transformation. So we'd love to hear your thoughts about that. I mean, you know, I also saw on your paper that you felt that the, um, the vaccine uh, supply chain has failed. Um, the last couple of years. And we saw that, you know, um, firsthand as well, you know, given uh, we're also involved with a few vaccine companies uh, for COVID. So, but we'd love right. to hear, I mean, you know, especially since, you know, all, all the various issues that came out, you know, um, um, you know, be it in US China, be it, you know, collaboration, you know, we've always talked about, you know, having joint collaboration, which would actually benefit all uh, the patients in the world, but we'd love to hear your thoughts about, you know, this area, thanks. No, I'd love to. Thank you so much. Um, so, just some observations. All of these transformations, and especially the the healthcare and biomedical ones, are being driven in part by these incredibly powerful tools um, that are now widely available because the costs have come down, and they're and they're just enormously powerful. So, I looked at the 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 cost patterns of DNA sequencing, which is core, you know. Uh, technology for advancement in biomedical science. And it behaved like Moore's law. Those costs behaved like Moore's laws uh, in the digital, in the semiconductor area for about 10 years. And then in the next 10 years, the costs went down even faster. So it outperformed Moore's law. And you went from, you know, $10 million at the start to $1,000 per sequence, full sequence now to $500. And you, you know, and you have gene editing. Uh, that, you know, I mean, I find this story fascinating, but, um, you know, this, this is something that people have learned how to do because by studying uh, bacteria and how bacteria defend themselves from, from viruses. So, so I think, and these tools are widely and globally available. So I think if there's one area where I'm reasonably quite hopeful, I think along with you, that this will be kind of a global endeavor. Um, it's it's in the it's in the biomedical healthcare area. Now, some of it's related to digital. We can remotely digi you know deliver healthcare. We'll get better and better at it. We'll have home diagnostics that are better and better. You know, fancy versions of your Apple Watch, um, and so on. Um, and then you've got artificial intelligence. You know, sort of capabilities with respect to things like image recognition. So, you know, you can de you can detect skin cancer remotely with a with a cell phone and using the camera of a cell phone because the AI algorithms are pretty good uh, at picking off skin cancers. They're not perfect substitutes for real top like dermatologists, but for people who live a long way away from a dermatologist, um, it's pretty impressive that you can get a, an initial reading that says, you know, you really do need to get on the train um, and come to a center where there are dermatologists to get checked out because this looks pretty worrying. Um, and you got, you know, di diabetic retinopathy is the same thing. It's a, it's a, um, a disease related to diabetes in the eye that causes blindness if it's not detected and treated. Um, so I think, you know, there's a, a, a range of, of things. The other observation I would make is that, you know, my friends in the investment world, you know, who operate globally find an enormously interesting set of uh, investments in the biomedical sciences and, and technologies in China. So this is part of the spreading of the, you know, of the sort of centers of innovation. Um, India is, you know, really quite advanced in many of these areas as well. So I think it's, it, this is one of the most promising areas. Now, you know, what are its impacts? Well, um, in, you know, treatment of, uh, genetically based diseases, very fast, you know, production of vaccines, um, dealing with the, you know, some of the less attractive versions of aging. I'm particularly interested in this at my, at my age, et cetera. Um, it, you know, it, it's a pretty exciting thing. And I think it's an area um, 
where there's less conflict. There's less sort of, you know, there there are fewer mixed and overlapping and conflicting agendas. Um, so I'm I'm kind of hopeful, and and certainly, uh, it does it does look to many people like a revolution in uh, in in breakthroughs in in biomedical science. You know, it, it, last comment. It goes way beyond just healthcare um, and treating disease and and developing drugs. Um, it you know you got major challenges in the in the sustainability area with respect to food supply and security, where these technologies you know need to be applied. I mean it's controversial. Um, you know, in Europe we don't like genetically modified things, but you know we may have to sort of change our attitudes toward that if that's what's required to produce uh, produce higher productivity you know less vulnerable crops um, in the global food supply so I mean this is a journey that we're on um, but it's a pretty exciting area and it's you know I mentioned it in part because it's less talked about uh, in the kind of general conversation than the than the global tensions or the or the digital one or even the energy transition Thank you. Next question from uh, Casey Kwok, CEO of the Academy of Finance. Casey. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Casey, uh, again. Hi, hi, Mike. Thanks, Norman. Well, first of all, Mike, on behalf of all the members and friends of the AOF, I want to say thank you again for sharing your insights with us today. There are a lot of very interesting points that we have heard from you. Um, the thank question you, I want to raise relates to the prospect of inflation or increasingly more and more people say stagflation. We have heard your points about you know, the exciting developments that are leading to productivity increases going forward. You mentioned the uh, biomedical sciences and the healthcare sector just now. You mentioned digitalization early on. So, and you also mentioned entrepreneurship. So all these are leading to pro uh, more productivity increases. Uh, right. You also mentioned, on the other hand, the Lewis turning point, which perhaps is not so um, conclusive. But up until about a year ago, we had quite a lot of talks of this so-called secular stagnation concept. I'm not so sure whether it was initially talked about by Larry Summers, but there mm -hmm. seems to be more and more people trying. Yeah, there seems to be more and more people, people talking about it, or perhaps some people talk about this Japanification of uh, other developing countries. So it seems that, uh, well, inflation is gone. We are going to enter a period of low inflation, low interest rates, and low growth because of aging and because of other factors. So suddenly, uh, uh, there. Yeah. Yeah, do you, or do, is, is stagnation, this secular stagnation argument dead? Should we be worried about persistent inflation going forward? Um, well, I think this uh, it's a good question. Um, I guess we'll find out by by you know through over time through experience. Um, I, I wouldn't dismiss the what, what you might call stagflationary pressures, um, Casey. But if if the question is you know, are we really going to have you know a low growth uh, sort of high inflation environment on an extended basis? I I don't, I don't see that. As the most likely outcome, I don't. I mean, I know China faces headwinds, um, but in the kind of short to medium run, as we had to end the pandemic and deal with some imbalances. But I don't think China's growth is exhausted, uh, and China's a big, pretty big, powerful growth engine. I, I, similarly, on the U.S. side, I mean, I, I think you know, with some of these tools and technologies that we just talked about. Um, we'd have to make a massive number of mistakes um, in order to sort of fail to take advantage of them. Uh, and it doesn't look to me, I mean, we, you know, we're capable of making lots of mistakes for sure, but it doesn't look to me like we're going to sort of crush all that potential. Now, you know, so the way I think about it is, you know, how fast is that going to happen? And the answer is it's not going to happen fast enough to take away the short run inflationary pressure that we now face. I mean, you know, it, these things just don't move that quickly, even when they're revolutions, when, when looked upon from a historical perspective. But, you know, if you're looking out five to 10 years, 
um, you know, then I don't, then I, I just don't see, um, you know, the the headwinds to growth being so strong. Um, and it, it's broader than growth. You know, we, I think we've made a transition in pretty much everywhere in the world to understanding that measuring economic and social progress is a multi-dimensional activity. And so maybe we'll have slower growth, but big improvements in healthcare and, um, and, you know, and big advances in sustainability, and they won't show up in sort of short run productivity and GDP growth numbers, but that's okay. I mean, I, you know, that's not fatal. Um, but so bottom line is, I, I don't, I don't, if I don't see stagflation as the most likely outcome. And, you know, the thing that worries me most, and I didn't talk about this because I'm not really an expert on it, is inability to produce policies that are induced by political uh, polarization and gridlock in a lot of places. Um, you know, the thing that the, the most dangerous thing to me, um, you know, lurking in the background is sort of political kind of instability. You know, the, and the way I describe it to people is I say, you know, we, in the international context, if we want to have relationships with each other, you know, we have to be reasonably predictable, you know, President Trump could win in 2024. You know, Mrs. Le Pen could have won in France. You know, the AFD in Germany could increase its, you know, power and scope. These things, you know, haven't happened yet. Um, but there, but there's a fair amount of internal uh, conflict and instability that affects the ability to generate both domestic and international policy. Um, that's coherent and stable over time and makes sense. And if some there's some major failure on that front, th then I think you know very bad economic outcomes based on poor policy choices like inflation and low growth become more likely. Well, we are running out of time. So let us, on behalf of Academy and all those participating in this webinar, thank you, Professor Spence for your insightful and generous sharing with us. We will, uh, I'd like to uh, hope to see you again uh, before long because the world is changing so quickly. Who may know what happened to us next? So- um, Thank you, Norman. It was a pleasure you, uh, being with you all. Thank you, Michael. And I would also like to thank our members and friends for joining us today. If you'd like to know more about our program, the Academy's program, please follow AOF on LinkedIn by scanning the QR code on the screen. Thank you and goodbye and hope to see you again soon.